the, this is the last uh, week of the series that we're doing, the retro series, Back to the Basics. And uh, we've, been, we've had a theme each week. The first week we talked about, uh, the, we've been doing it by the decades. So the first week was the 1960s, and I wasn't around in the 60s, but uh, I would say probably the best thing about the 60s was the cars. There were some great muscle cars. And then, uh, and then the 70s was week two, and, and then the 80s was last week, by far the best decade in my humble opinion. But, um, and, and, then, and then today's the 1990s. Now, we've been taking some old school topics, you know, and, and by the way, uh, even though our church is a church plant, you know, we're, we're just a few years old, uh, I'm still, I still consider myself old school, like doctrinally, theologically, I still just preach the Bible, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're never going to get away from that, even though aesthetically it might look different than the church that you grew up in, we're still Bible-believing Christians, and we're always going to be that, and so uh, we just try to, try to stick with that. And so we've been taking some old school topics. The, the first week we talked about repentance. You don't hear a lot of preachers nowadays talking. Nobody wants to get up and shout about you need to repent of your sins. But you know what? Uh, you know, I, I told you the first week, I said, you know, some pastors will say, I just want people to feel good. And, and I just feel like it feels good to be right with God. And you can't do that without repenting of your sins. And we all struggle with sin. But you can't, you can't hold on to that. You got to repent. And then the, in the next week, we talked about obedience, just obeying the voice of God no matter what he says. And, and then last week, we talked about worship and just, just getting back to the basics of worshiping God on, on just a very basic level. And today, we're talking about evangelism. And this is a, I mean, this is at the core of what we're doing, okay? This is huge. You may not be, if you're not a church person, you haven't been around church a long time, you may not know what evangelism is. We'll, we'll get to that, and it may seem like an old school, uh, you know, it's a retro term that we don't, you may not hear in everyday language, but it's, it's vitally important to what we're doing. So uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about the 1990s. Okay, this is our theme, so I, w- I was going to wear some MC Hammer pants, but I couldn't find any. Uh, but the 90s were, how many, how many of you guys grew, were around in the 90s? You remember the 90s? How many of you guys were born in the 90s? Raise your hand. You were born in the 90s? Yeah, just some pups. How many of you guys graduated like me in the 90s? I graduated in 1992. Yeah. And so uh, the, the 90s, what, what I said was, you know, uh, in, just in my mind, sort of representative of the 1960s was like records, and I have an old school record player. I played, uh, I think, Hank Williams' uh, record a few weeks ago, and uh, so this is some vinyl. My kids don't know anything about records like that. Uh, and then the 70s are representative of this 8-track right here. You guys, some, how many of you guys had an 8-track player growing up? Yeah. And so uh, that's, that's really old school there. And then these cassette tapes were in the 80s, you know, so we had a lot of cassette tapes. We talked about that last week, and we had these Walkmans, right? I talked about having a Walkman. I mean, look, you, you'd go jogging with this, and you just thought you were so cool, and, and you weren't. But, <laughs> uh, and and so, so and then in the 90s, somewhere, like, they invented CDs, like, eight, late 80s into the 90s, but the 90s is representative of the CD, and, and I have this Walkman, or uh, this is a Walkman, I get, what, is this a Discman, Discman, something like, I don't know, I didn't call it that back in the day, but we had these, and these, some of these even came with clips on them, and you, you, anyone ever tried to go jogging with one of these with that, and it, every time you take a step, it skips, right, and, and uh, yeah, this is some, it's crazy how technology has advanced through the years, but I have, um, you ready with, ready with this, John? Uh, I have a CD in here. Um, this is, is it not? Oh, it's not plugged in. That would be important to. So I'll give you two million points if you can identify, if you weren't in the first service, who, who's singing this right here? Let's see here. It's a Christmas album. What'd you say? It doesn't sound right. I don't. It. No. 
Okay, so this is a blast from the past. You want to talk about retro. If you're not, if you didn't grow up in church and you've been, been around church for 25 years, you, the, you won't know who this is. But that was Rebecca St. James. You got, if you were, she was really popular in the 90s. And she had some awesome stuff. But uh, yeah, that, that, she kind of disappeared after the 1990s. But um, so that's what we had. We had these Walkmans, and then we had Discmans, and then things of, and then we had MP3 players, and of course now you have everything on your phone, you know, videos and songs and everything. It's just it's crazy how far we've progressed. Um, here's something that's sort of to me in the 90s. I don't know. It might not be the exact date, but remember these? Remember these floppy disks? So originally the the floppy disk was. Um, for the old school computers, they were bigger, and they were actually floppy, and you put them in there. Now, this right here, this says um, 1, 1. 1.44 megabytes. Do you know how small that is? And the original floppy disk was like a fraction of this. It was so small. And when they invented this, everyone said, oh, man, this is so so much room on here. We're never going to need anything bigger than that. And now you couldn't even fit a song on here. You, get, you can't even, the picture you take with your iPhone wouldn't even fit on here. That's how small this is. And that's how big the files are that we have nowadays. It's so crazy how far. And of course, now on your computer, back, back then in the old days, the original computers, you couldn't, you couldn't fit a song on there. You couldn't fit any big files. But now you, some of you guys have computers that you can fit all kinds of videos and you download stuff off YouTube all the time. Um, here's some pictures from the 1990s. I only just have a few. Uh, I didn't get many. This is Lee. He goes to our church. He, this is 1991, I guess. Uh, this is Wendy. Look at that hair. I, t- I tried to get her to do her hair like that today, but she wasn't going for it. Uh, go, this is Jackie. She sent me that one. Um, some of you, got, what year was this, Jackie? 98. So some of you guys have pictures of you from the 90s with the big hair or whatever. You need to post those on Facebook or send them to me because I, I want to see them. Um, remember, uh, we talked about this last week a little bit, but this was 90s too. Go to the next slide. Remember Blockbuster? Of course, in the, in the 80s, it was, it was VHS tapes that you had to rent, and then in the 90s, it was DVDs. But you still had to go to Blockbuster to get a DVD, and uh, you got to be careful not to scratch them, right? At least with the DVD, you, had, you didn't have to rewind it and, and all of that. And then um, go, <laughs> you guys remember this, right? This was classic from the 1990s, the, the chase of O.J. Simpson in 1994, that was it. That just was on every TV station. You couldn't get away from it. And uh, here's another thing that happened in the 1990s. Remember when Mike Tyson bit his ear? This is. I w- there's another picture. I was going to show it to you of the ear missing and big old chunk out of it, but it was gruesome. I didn't want to do that to you. But here's what I don't understand. Okay, it, it, that happened. This was like 1995 or something like that. 97. I don't. I don't understand. So he bit his ear, and Holyfield jumps back and was like, "He bit my ear." And then they started of fighting again, and he bit his other ear, like took a chunk out. I'm just telling you, you only get one bite out of me. That's I, that, if you bite me once, I'm not. I'm not touching you again. You understand? Like that was so crazy that they let them continue to fight, and he bit his other ear off. I, I don't understand it. It's wild. Um, how many of you guys had these in the 1990s? You know what these are? Doc Martens? Yeah. I, lo- I had that same exact pair right there. I loved them, and I had them for like six years. It was awesome. So, because uh, they're leather, they lasted forever. Um, all right, go to the next slide. A lot of you guys, this was popular, the Sony Playstations, and then the, this next one, Game Boys. You guys had, had a Game Boy? Um, all right, just leave, leave, yeah, leave it right here. So the, in the first service, all the kids are in here, and they're, they're, all my kids were in here, and so it's a, it's a little bit different service. You guys are all adults. I don't see any kids in here. But um, so, and even like uh, Lauren, how old are you, Lauren? 20, you're 24. You won't know this. Chris, you won't know this. But when I say star 69... You, you guys know. Do you know what that is? Laura, no, don't say it. Do you know what star 69 is? She does. She does. It's, okay, so you just need to get a glimpse into what we grew up with. Because, look, when, when back in the day, I talked about this last week, we had phones that were attached to the wall. 
And if somebody called you and you didn't get to it in time, you didn't know who that was. You just, you, you, you didn't know if it was a bill collector, a telemarketer, or if it was an emergency that, that someone was trying to get a hold of you. So what they invented, I don't know when it was, but at some point they invented this thing, star 69. So if you missed a call, whoever called last, you just hit star 69, and it would call back the last number of whoever tried to call you. Remember that? And, it, and then you'd find out it was just a telemarketer, and so it was a waste of your time. And they also had star 67 where you could block a call. Remember that? And then, so that was a big deal. That was an advancement in technology for us. We were able to call back the last number. And then th this happened right here. Remember this? Caller ID. Caller ID. Oh, yeah. they, 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 they put a little thing on the, next to the phone. You had to plug it in next to the phone. And it would actually tell you who the person was calling. So you would know that your, that's your uh, you know, mother-in-law. You don't want to answer that. You know what I mean? Like, you, or, or whatever. You, just, you could screen the calls now. And that's what call, caller ID was a game changer. Because prior to that, we had, we had to deal with this right here. And even around that time. Remember the answering machine? You had this device hooked up to the phone. So if you didn't make it to the phone or if you weren't home... They would leave a message on this, these tapes, these little miniature tapes, and you get home and you would listen to all your messages. And it's just, that was just way old school. Things have come so far. And then technology advanced through the 90s, and we, we got this. How many guys had the original beeper, the pager? And funny, the, the story that I remember about this, I was in high school, probably a, a senior in high school, and one of my friends, Preston Propes, uh, his dad was a doctor, and his dad had that pager, that same pager, and one day he let his son take it to school. Actually, I don't think he let him. He kind of stole it, but he took it to school, and he was showing everyone. He had it on his belt. He thought he was so cool, and the principal called him into his office, and he literally asked him. He was like, are you dealing drugs, son? You know, he literally asked him that because he was like, no one had, he was like, only drug dealers have pagers like that. It was so funny, and, uh, and then, so we had this for, because this was, you have a pager? Oh, my gosh. Is it for work or something? That's awesome. So the, for the younger people in here, this, somebody, somebody would just, you would call a number, right, and it would be the pager number, and it would just show up the number. And then it got, you, that's, all, that's all it could do. You just show that someone called you, but it was on your hip. It was so cool. And then technology advanced a little bit, and they invented the, the Motorola. Remember that? And then you could actually get little messages. We thought we were so cool. But listen, you weren't cool unless you had one of these right here. How many guys had the see-through uh, chartreuse color pager? Those were so awesome. You just carried them around. Huh? And you had the little chain. Yeah, you put the little chain on the side, and you clip it on your belt. That way it didn't fall off and break. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, and, and then technology advanced a little bit more, and we got, I talked about this last week. Go to the next slide. That was probably, I think, my first cell phone, the little flip phone right there, the Motorola. And, uh, huh? Yeah, I talked about that last week, the bag phone, um, last two weeks, so uh, that was, yeah, that was, the bag phone was before that, and then, and then the Nokia, remember the Nokias, some of you guys had that, I had a Nokia for a long time, those were good phones, um, and then, uh, let's see, oh, remember, really quick, leave it here for a second, I just thought about this this morning, remember, um, okay, Lauren and, and, and even Chris, you probably don't remember this, but remember, Remember uh, long-distance calling? Remember that? Remember MCI? We actually had to sign up for a long-distance calling plan, and, and, and you know, MCI and AT&T, and, and, and of course, now I can get on my cell phone and call anywhere in the country, and it's free, you know what I mean? But back in the day, if you wanted to call your relatives in another state, it cost money, and so we just didn't do it, and it, th things have just progressed so much. It's so crazy. Now... Uh, again, for the younger people in here, I don't know, uh, this is what we were working with. I want to give you a blast from the past. This is what we were working with, okay? Back in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s and 60s, we, this is an encyclopedia, Britannica. So if I had a question about something and I wanted to find out about butterflies or anything, I had to go to the encyclopedia and I had to open it up. Of course, they had pictures, so I, I like that. And you had to read in pages, you know, you know what I'm saying? 
And it's so crazy because now, you know, I, if, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I, I have a, a smartphone. And so several times a day, I will, a, pop, a thought will pop in my head. And it's like, who was the president in 1976 or, or, 17, or not 17, 1876 or whatever? And I'll just be like, who was that? And I'll get my phone out and it'll instantly come up. And then I'll just start studying about all the presidents and then the vice presidents and Four hours later, I'm like, I got to get up and do something. I can't, I just crawled into this rabbit hole and I got to, I got to do something productive today. But this is what, if you wanted information and knowledge, we had to look in the encyclopedia. And then the game completely changed. Our world changed when this happened, when Al Gore invented the internet. If you, if you remember that, he created the internet and it changed everything. It changed our world you know, mostly for the good, but a lot for the bad. There's a lot of crazy stuff on the internet. Um, but what, well, once that happened, we didn't need encyclopedias anymore. You had everything at the touch of a button. Um, and then and then things continue to progress with the internet. I don't know what what year you had the internet, but I was a little bit late to the game. But some of you guys did this. This will bring back memories and maybe a flashback a little bit. Let's Let's check this out. Remember AOL? Listen, turn it up. Welcome. You've got mail. It's like nails on a chalkboard. It was so. It was exciting at first. You were like, "Oh, I get the internet." It was so amazing. But after a while, it was like, "Oh, that sound is so terrible." Now the thing about dial-up, and some of you guys will remember this. So you had to have it connected to your phone, right? So if you were on the internet, you couldn't use the phone. And so a lot of times you would, um, you know, you get screamed at by your parents. Like, get off the phone, I got to make a call. Or get off the internet, I got to make a call. And so you would do it. I didn't talk about this last week. I meant to. But this was a thing way back in the day when I was, you know, when we had phones like this. Okay. So you would be talking on the phone. I remember talking on the phone for like, like I had, you know, you try to talk to your girlfriend in the seventh grade and, and you know, you're just leaning up against the wall and, you know, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. But, you know, stuff like that. But you're on the phone. But, and my kids don't know anything about this, but what, what could happen is there was another phone in the other room and somebody could come and get on the phone if they're real quiet. They could listen in and your little brother would listen to you or your little sister, right? And they, they, would, they would listen to your whole conversation and, uh, and, but what happened at my house is I would be on the phone with a girl in the seventh grade, and my dad, my, my nephews are in here, they know, my dad would come pick up the other phone, get off the blankety-blank phone, this is my work phone, and he would cuss, cuss these girls out, and I would just be like, oh my gosh, I'm so, I was so humiliated, he would do that every time, every time he would cuss out whoever I was talking to, because that was his work phone, he had an ad in the paper, and they would call, Billy and Brandon, our, our, our number growing up, my number growing up was 4610780, I'll never forget that, and it was in the ad in the paper, and my dad just, that was his work number, so he would cuss out everyone who called, it was, anyways, I'm not scarred for life, but uh, I sort of am. And then, uh, so, so Al Gore invented the internet, and then after that, uh, in, in addition to that, this happened. This really changed a lot of things. Remember Napster? Remember, remember when they, I mean, it was completely illegal. I mean, we were ripping off people's songs, downloading illegally their songs, but, but it was just, oh my gosh, all these, my favorite songs, and so your computer was just filled with all these songs that you had stolen, and some people went to jail, and then... Um, and then this happened. Remember, this was like the end of the, the decade of the 1990s, this right here. Remember Y2K had everybody in a panic? The, the media had everyone, you know, thinking it was doomsday, the end of the world. Because here's what, I mean, if you're younger, you don't really know, but the, they said, you know, every electronic device we had, every computer has an internal clock in it, and when it hits midnight on 2000, and, on 2000 it goes from 1999 to 2000, it's going to cause everything to go haywire, and there's going to be a nuclear holocaust, and everybody's going to die. Everybody was so panicked and freaked out. Do you remember where you were in 1999, New Year's Eve? Uh, yeah, it was. everyone was a little bit freaked out on edge, just wondering if the world was coming to an end. Christians were thinking Jesus was coming back that night and everything, so... And it didn't happen. 
right? Where nothing happened. It was like we just went on like normal and everybody was wrong, just like the media is all the time. They're always wrong about everything. They're just trying to create a panic for everybody. So let's talk about some of this, uh, some sitcoms. Uh, from the, I don't have a lot of them, but go to these sitcoms. These are the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That was great. Seinfeld, in my opinion, is probably the best sitcom ever made. Go to the next one. Yeah, this is a, that's a movie. I don't know how that got in there. Go to the next one. Blossom. Remember Blossom? Remember Home Improvement? Saved by the Bell. That was probably my favorite in the late 80s, 90s. And then here's some movies from. From the, there were not a lot of great ones from the 90s, believe it or not. I didn't think. I mean, Big Daddy was good. Groundhog Day, that's one of the ones I'll watch every time it comes on. Adam's Family, Liar, Liar, The Nutty Professor, Mrs. Doubtfire. Dumb, Dumb and Dumber is probably, in my opinion, top five movies ever made. It just, uh, Billy Madison. Clueless, Coneheads, that was a great movie. Tommy Boy, that's probably in the top 10 of mine. And then Father of the Bride. All right, so every week I've been doing a, a thing with the songs. That, so there's a, I went on YouTube and there's 100 top songs of the 1990s. And obviously I, I edited, them, edited them down to the top 10 or whatever. And so let's watch that. My tea's gone cold, I'm wondering why. Backstreet Boys, that was Chris's favorite band. No, I'll just get out. Yeah. So there, when I, in studying for this, you know, I was, I, I edited that down to, from 100 to whatever that was, this handful of songs. And uh, there were, there were a lot of other good songs that I remember from the, from the 90s. But uh, honestly, I couldn't show them. I'm like, I, I can't show, because there were like, filthy stuff in the in the lyrics or in the video like half naked women or even more than that and i was so it just it, sort of a re revelation that i came across is that 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 the 90s is about the time where things changed there i mean there were some things in the 80s but but all this raunchy stuff that's in in mainstream now uh, it became mainstream in the 90s so pretty much my generation screwed everything up for everybody to where to where it is now, I told you guys uh, a couple years ago, I was doing some research for a, a sermon, and I just went on uh, online and looked at the top 10. I was like, what are the top 10 most popular songs right now? Like, you know, the top 40 or whatever. And four out of the top five had, an F, had the F-bomb in the lyrics. 
And I'm like, this is what's on the radio. Your kids are listening to that. Some of you guys are listening to that. And so it's, it, it's just become mainstream now, and that's, that's how we got where we are. We just, our generation, my generation really just dropped the ball. And so anyways, let's get into this. I want to talk about evangelism uh, for a little bit. And uh, this is a, a huge, hugely important topic. I mean, this is at the core of everything we believe in Christianity and We've got, to, we've got to do a better job at this. So what is evangelism? Uh, evangelism is basically just sharing your faith with other people. It's, it's telling other people about God. Now, some of you guys, when we talk about this, and, and you, you hear me up here telling you that you need to share your faith with another person, it terrifies you. You're scared to death because you're like, I can't, I can't talk to somebody about Yes, you can. You do it all the time. Some of you guys have no problem going on Facebook and telling everyone who you're voting for November, like like everyone knows who you're for and who you're against, like you share what's most important to you all the time if you have social media, but why is it that when it comes to sharing our faith, it intimidates people, okay? It ought not to be that way, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today, and so I just, I just want you to understand that at some point, you've got to share what God has done with you in your life with other people. That's your job. It's not, it, listen to me, I want you to look up here. It's not Pastor Joey's job. It's not Pastor Chad's job or Chuck's. It's, it's not just our job because we're, you know, ordained and we're in the ministry. It's everybody's job. That, honestly, that's why, that, that's why we're in the predicament that we are in America because going back you know, decades ago, people were just like, ah, I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to let the, the professionals handle that. But it's your job. We, it's time that we stand up and start proclaiming the gospel in our community again. All right, so let's get into this. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, I got several scriptures we're going we're gonna to look at. Number, uh, uh, number 17, or, or uh, verse number 17, here's what it says. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Now, if you've been here before, you know that this is my favorite verse in the Bible. This is my life verse. When I got saved, they gave me a pocket New Testament, and they highlighted 2 Corinthians 5.17, and I think I had the King James Bible at that little pocket New Testament, and it said something like, uh, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, Behold, old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. And I love that. Just, just look at this. It says, this means, so this is talking about the moment of salvation. And it's so important. I, I want you to lean in on this. I, I've got to talk about this because um, I hear people tell me all the time, Pastor Joey, I've always been a Christian. And I always say, with all due respect, you're, you haven't. Nobody has always been a Christian. Nobody. Now, you might have always believed in God. In fact, you probably have. That, I I got saved when I was 22 years old, but I've always believed in God. There was never a time in my life from a child all the way to now where I didn't believe in God. But there was a time before I got saved that even though I believed I had a mental assent about God, I would have checked the box that I believe there's a God. I would have went to hell if I would have died in that moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? There has a, the, Jesus said it like this. He goes, you must be born again. So every person in this room, I don't care if you grew up in church and you've done really well in your life, there has to be a moment in time where, where the Bible talks about you cross over from death into life. Now, for me, it's easy because I, I, I remember that day. I, I was a horrible person before I got saved. And so there was a distinct uh, difference between who I used to be and who I am now. And I remember the day and the time and where I was at when that happened. Now, there, I, I know a lot of Christians that don't, they're like, I don't really remember the day. And that's okay, but you do have to recognize that you have to be born again. And it happened in a moment in time. So even though you don't remember when that moment was, you, you know that it was around this certain time. You may not remember the day or the hour, but you got to understand that there was, a, there was the old you that was lost, and if you would have died in that state, you would have went to hell for all of eternity, and you got saved, and Jesus changed you. Now, what, the, the word that comes to my mind when I think about this, because when, when, this is a beautiful thing right here. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That means Everything that you've ever done, your old life is gone. It's washed in the blood. So stop carrying that around. Stop beating yourself up for the mistakes that you used to make. He goes, the old life is gone and a new life has begun. So you're a new you. And the word that comes to my mind is metamorphosis. That's, that's the word I think of. You, what do you think of when I say metamorphosis? 
A butterfly. We all know about the metamorphosis process when there's a caterpillar and it's, it's a hairy caterpillar that crawls on the ground and eats dust and then it goes into a cocoon and it comes out with wings and it's this beautiful butterfly and it flies, right? That's the metamorphosis process and that's exactly what happens when you get saved. You, the old you is, is not good and you get saved and you come out of this metamorphosis with wings like, like a butterfly and God expects you to flap your wings and show the world that this is awesome. Now listen to me. Some of you guys, you really enjoy going back and hanging out with caterpillars, and you got to stop it. Stop hanging out with caterpillars. That's not who you are anymore. That's the old you. Do you really want to go back on the ground and eat dirt all the time when you have wings? So my message to you is, hey, that's not who you are anymore. You're a butterfly. You should spread your wings and fly. And it's not just so, oh, great, look at this. I'm enjoying flying. No, it's because there are other people that that God wants to put you on this display and, and they go, man, your wings are really beautiful. How did that happen? And you, that's what evangelism is. That's when you get to tell them, hey, let me tell you, because this right here, this didn't happen. I didn't do this. Okay. You should have seen the old me. And some of you guys, you know, knew the old me. And, and I knew some of you guys before you were Christians and, and it wasn't good. And so it's, it you get a chance to tell people, hey, this, this, God did this. God turned me into a butterfly. These wings that I have that are so beautiful, it's not me. It's what God has done in my life. And, and so God wants to put us on display. Okay, so let's, let's finish this passage. And he goes in verse 18, he goes, all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Now, this is the important part that you got you to gotta listen to. He goes, and God has given us, everybody say us, us. It's not just me, it's, it's us. He goes, God has given us, us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, everybody say us, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And he's, yeah, everybody say us. We, we, everybody say we. we. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God, uh, God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So what he's talking about there is this ministry of reconciliation. I've talked about this before. You know, do you know, you know what it means to reconcile, right? We think of that in the context of like a relationship, like maybe a husband and wife split up and then they reconcile things and they're back together or something like that. Or you have a friend and you guys are at odds, but then you guys reconcile. The, my favorite definition of that is someone said, reconciliation is making mortal enemies the best of friends. And, and that's what Christ did on the cross. And so we, whenever you and I, were, we have this old life and we accept Christ in that moment in time, we're now reconciled to God. God makes you a child of his. He gives you a home in heaven and everything has changed. You're reconciled with God. But listen to me. This is what this message is all about. God didn't just do that so that just for you, because if he did at that moment, he could have just plucked you out of here and taken you on home. Have you ever wanted that before? I certainly have. Have you ever been trudging through life and go, man, life is really tough right now. God, why don't you just take me on home? I think we've all longed for that at times. But why does God leave you here? Because it's not just about you. It, it's, like, it's like this. It's like all of these people, and I'm not talking about you guys. I'll just do this over here. But, but here's all the people that are saved. It, because... Because God, you know, what we do is we like to divide people. We, we like to put people in camp, categories in camps. And all of these people over here are Democrats and these people are Republicans. Or, you know, you may take offense to that or you may take offense to that. But, or, or, or you guys are black and you guys are white or you guys are whatever. We, we do that. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't categorize people that. You know how God categorizes people? He looks down from heaven and all he sees is people that he loves. And he sees, you know, if you go back and look in Matthew 24 and 25, and it talks about at the end of time when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a separation of the sheep and the goats. All the sheep are going to be over here, and all the goats are over here. All the sheep are God's Christians. 
and, and all the goats are people who haven't accepted Christ yet. Now, God loves everybody, but God's looking at this group over here, and you guys are redeemed. You guys have a home in heaven. You're all going to go to heaven for all of eternity. It's great. But, but what happens is God's looking at this group over here and going, well, I love this group over here too. And what I want you guys to do is this group over here is supposed to be trying to recruit the people over here so that they're not in this group anymore and they become a part of this group. But God doesn't force people. What God does, the way God chose to do it, is he chooses you and he just puts you on display. Like on Facebook when you post like a, a, a verse of the day or whatever. You're, you're showing your wings. Or when you're an encouragement to somebody and you give someone a handwritten card or, or an encouraging word. Just any number of ways. God's like, I want to take you who I've redeemed and I want to show you to this group over here so that they see there's something appealing and attractive about you. And so they go, hey, I think I might want that, right? But the problem is this group over here, you and me, all too often are apathetic, and you're going, and I'm just, I'm busy, man. I got, I got stuff to do. Life is tough, you know, and I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with people, and my job is, you know, stressing me out, and I can't pay the bills, and I'm do, I got to work two jobs. I got to do all this stuff, and God's like, whatever you're worried about is not as important as what I'm doing over here. Like, like the stuff that you're involved in, although it might be really important to you, is not near as important as what God wants to do over here. Because, yes, you're going to, etern- you're going to heaven for all of eternity. Awesome. Good for you. But what about these people? Your job and my job is to show them that they want to come over here. You can't force them, but you show them. And the sad reality is, and this is why it's really quiet in here because I feel like I'm lecturing you and yelling at you, but all of us, we get too busy doing our thing over here, and we don't care enough about lost people to really make a difference in their life, right? And we need to, we need to get back to that. That's what getting back to the basics is all about, is, is, is about law, being concerned about lost people. Okay, so because God wants to reconcile with those people, and he's given you and I that ministry to reconcile people to himself. So let me give you in your notes, I think, six things I want you to write down if you're taking notes. But number one, I just want you to understand based on this passage is that we are God's representatives, okay? We're, we're representatives. So the group over here... God is God's representatives. You're trying to display for the world that doesn't know him what it looks like to be a Christian. So in the passage, they, they use the word ambassadors, right? I love that. I love the term ambassador. And, and you know what an ambassador is. Like the United States has ambassadors for every country uh, around the world. So they'll take a, a person and that person goes over to another country and stays there. And, and they're not a citizen of that country, but they're, an amb- they're a citizen of the United States and they're there representing America's interests. Okay, that's what an ambassador is. So in, terms, in that same terms, we are God's ambassadors. So here's what you got to understand about that, is that once I became a Christian, once I crossed over, I'm now a citizen of heaven. Like that, so we basically have dual citizenship. Even though I live on planet Earth and I'm an American, and by the way, I love America. I really do. I consider myself a patriot. I have an American flag outside my house, and I'm so appreciative of the men and women who have fought and died uh, for this country to preserve the freedoms that we have. But listen to me, I want you to understand that if you have a flagpole out in front of your house and you have a Christian flag and you have an American flag, the Christian flag should go over the American flag, okay? That's how it should. You should be a citizen of heaven before you're a citizen of the United States. And I see a lot of Christians that have a great allegiance to the United States of America even before their allegiance to God. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're dual citizens, and you can be a great American, and you can love this country. It's great. Do that. But you should love the kingdom of heaven more than you love your country, Okay? You, you just should. And I see a lot of Christians getting this wrong. And so we're dual citizens. We're, we're supposed to be representing our eternal kingdom, okay, and not just the United States of America. So number two, the second thing I want to say about this based on this passage is that we are God's spokesman. Now, I know that, that this goes without saying, but it means that you need to speak. If you're a spokesperson for somebody, you need to open your mouth and you need to say something. So you need to speak to people about it, okay? Don't hide it. And so here's what people will say. I've heard this objection from people that go to our church. Maybe you've said this. Well, Pastor Joey, 
I, I just I keep my faith private. You know, this is just between me and God, and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to cram it down people's throat. And I would say with all due respect, that's crap, okay? That's crap, okay? I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I do know, but I'm not going to say it because that, that you're telling me that, that God's done all of this for you. He's transformed your life, and you can't share that with somebody. You don't have any problem telling people who you're voting for. You don't have any problem telling people that you're a Chiefs fan, and I'm a Chiefs fan. I love, Go Chiefs. I, I hope they win tomorrow night and everything. But, but look, I, I, we've got to be vocal about that. We need to share what's most important to us, and that's about our faith. So you are God's spokesperson. Because, look, let me just think about this right now. In, in America right now, we're in a crisis. You, you look at the news, you see the same thing I do. You see how it's trending, just like with the songs I told you about. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Do you know why? It's because you and I are not doing our jobs. Do you know that there are more people converting to be Muslims in the United States than converting to be Christians today? Do you know that? It's great because the Muslims are doing a better job at evangelizing than we are. And, and just last, uh, a few weeks ago, someone knocked on my door and they're a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. I don't care what you say. They're, it's a cult. And, and so, but, but you know what? They knocked on my door and they're out, they're out pounding doors. They're trying to convert people to become Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, I appreciate you coming by, they, you know, because I really do respect their resolve. I said, thank you, but no thank you. I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm a pastor and all that. And you know what they did? They didn't leave it there. They sent me a handwritten note the next week, and, and they keep sending me stuff. And, and while I don't agree with their message, man, I, I agree with their philosophy and their, their methods. You know what I'm saying? Um, we, and we're not doing anything. We have the truth on our side, and we're not doing any of that for people. And so I just I look at that, and I, I think you, you know what's going to happen in America it's going to come a day, not in a long distance future, in a long time, but in the, in the near distant future, there's going to come a time where other countries are going to be sending missionaries to the United States of America to evangelize the people that you and I are living next door to. And you know whose job that is? It's you. It's me. We're supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be recruiting people for the gospel. But all too often, people are just busy and we're not doing our job, okay? So... I feel like I'm really lecturing people now and making people uncomfortable. We're going we're gonna to move on. Let, let me show you this in um, Matthew chapter 5, okay? Matthew 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what Jesus said. Um, can somebody, can you, can someone turn on the air? I turned it off earlier. It's just really, it's getting hot in here. Uh, I'm blowing a lot of hot air up here, so, uh, and I'm under these lights, these heat lamps, like they got to, um, all right, so let's look at this. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what Jesus said. He goes, you are the light of the world. He says, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. He goes, Jesus goes, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand. He says, where it gives light to everyone in the house. He goes, in the same way, he goes, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So God, like I said before, God wants, he has placed his light inside of you, just like a jack-o'-lantern, you place that out so people can see it, and it's a great picture. God puts his light in you, and he wants to display you to the world so that people will see that and go, man, there's something, something different about you. But he goes, why would you light a light? Why would you light a lamp and then put a basket on it? It makes no sense, but that's what happens when you as a Christian go, yeah, you know, this is just my personal faith. I don't really want to share this with people, or I don't really want to cause waves. I don't want to offend anybody. No, if they get offended because of the gospel, that's their problem. We, we need to be actively sharing the gospel with people. And, and I love what he says. He goes, he, goes, Light, he goes, let your good deeds shine out for all the world to see. So why? So that they will praise your heavenly Father. Now, at Grace Church, this is one of the reasons why... I want you to get involved at Grace Church because our church, we work really hard. We are involved in the community. Anyone that knows anything about our church, they know we serve Ott, we serve at Christman, we do faith in action. We're doing stuff in the community on a weekly basis. And why do we do that? We're not doing that to garner praise from the community towards us. We're doing that to get attention for God so that when they go, man, there's something different about Grace Church, we go, well, it's not us because if you knew the, you knew the person I used to be, it not, it's not good. 
And it's our opportunity to share Jesus with our community. So when we, when we go and serve at Ott, when we go serve at uh, Faith in Action or at Christman or do those things, it's, it's, it's what we're doing. We're trying to shine our light bright so people will praise God. And, and come to him. So there's one thing that we do. Our church is, we have a ton of people in recovery. And because I'm in recovery, I kind of make that a focus. I prioritize that. But one of the things that we do is people who come to our recovery group, um, I make a big, a really big deal out of sober dates, sobriety dates. So when someone celebrates six months or when someone celebrates a year, we throw a party or two years or any year we throw a party and we make a big deal. Out. And there's, there's people like, uh, like Jenny's going to c- celebrate in December a year. That's going to be, seriously, if, if you knew her story, that's a miracle. It's a miracle, and there are people in this room that are celebrate that that have years of sobriety. Now, in the first service, Jeff and Hillary were in here, now, and and in uh, November we're going to celebrate their eight year. They're they're going to celebrate eight years, and they're married, and they've only been married for a couple years, and so they they got sober eight years ago within a week apart of each other. It's a really cool story, but so they're at a point now where it's like. They're not, they're not white-knuckling it every day going, oh, I don't know if I'm going to use today. They're past all of that. They've progressed. and So, so they don't really need a, bur- a, a, a party for their eight-year anniversary or eight-year sobriety. Day. You know why I'm going to make a big deal out of it? Not for them, but for other people that are still struggling so that I can pr- put them up and say, man, if you knew what Jeff was like before he got saved, I mean, he was a meth addict. He, his, his own mother wouldn't let him come home anymore. That's how bad it was. If you knew what he was like and the person he is today, that's a God thing. So we're going to put them up and show the world, hey, if you're struggling, if God can do it for Jeff, he can do it for you too. That's what God does in people's lives. That's why God wants you to share your story because there's somebody who struggles with the same thing you struggle. And, and, and God's like, I want to put you up and, and shine, let your good deeds shine out for all the world to see. Why? So they'll pat you on the back and say, you're a good Christian. No, so that they will praise your heavenly father. That's the, that's the purpose of it all. So let me get, go, go on to the next one is number three is we are expected to share our testimony. You just are. I don't, I don't care what you say. I don't care what objection you have. You, you have to share your testimony. So you say, well, what's my testimony? Well, your testimony is anything that God has done in your life. So by raising your hand, raise your hand if God has ever done any good thing in your life. Okay? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone's hands should go up or you're just not, you're dead. Okay? You're, because you woke up this morning. That's God's grace. Okay? God's letting you breathe his air right now. He, he's letting us enjoy this air conditioning right now. That's God's grace. How often do we go through our day and just take for granted all the blessings of God? And it's time we get back to the basics of this. So we have a testimony to share, okay? If God has done anything good in your life, you should share that with other people. In fact, that's why God did it. Now, God loves you as his child, but God doesn't just do those things for you. He wants to do it for other people. You're just the recipient of that, okay? Uh, number four, just want you to write this down. We are expected to leverage our resources and influence for God. So when I talk about influence, I don't know if you know this or not, but you are an influencer. You know, on, we hear about these social media influencers. Have you guys seen those? The, there's, uh, there's these little girls who have YouTube accounts with millions of followers, and uh, my daughters will watch them, and they're, they're just like doing hair and putting on makeup and stuff and making bows. And the, the little girl, Jojo, whatever, Sweela or whatever her name is, she's a multi She's 16 years old, and she's been doing it for like 10 years, and, uh, and my daughters love her, and she, she's got all this line of stuff, but she's a social media influencer, and to be honest, she's not doing anything of eternal value. You know what I mean? Like, she's just, she, it, she's not doing anything bad, but nothing she's talking about is going to last in an eternity, but you and I if you have a social media platform, I want you to know this, that you are a social media influencer. You are. You are influencing somebody. So a lot of you guys try to influence the election, and you want someone to vote for the person you want them to. That's fine. I don't care about that. But whatever's important to you, you're trying to influence people. And I would hope that at some point, if you're a Christian and you follow God, that you're going to try to influence other people to do the same. And it could be as little as 
hey, check in at Grace Church when you get here on Sunday morning. Just say, hey, I'm at Grace Church. And people will go, I'm not ready right now, but maybe someday I, I will be interested in that. Or sharing the verse. I try to do that almost every day. Share the verse of the day. It's just one verse. I get on a regular basis, and I'm not pat myself on the back, but just I've intentionally done this. I've intentionally tried to, if you go on my social, on Facebook, I don't post anything political, nothing. It doesn't mean I don't have political views. I'm just not getting into that because I decided a long time ago, I, don't, I just want to be a, a positive influence. And so I, I've gotten, there's like two teachers at art school that will send me messages all the time going, man, it's so crazy in this world. They go, I just want to thank you for being positive. They go, I go to your page for positivity and, and to read the verse of the day and all of that. That's what I want. That's what all of us should be. I don't want to be known for being a political hack. I don't, I, I, don't want to, I don't want you to remember me because I voted for any particular party. Or I mean, I think politics are probably important, but I want to be known as a Christian, and I want to influence the world for Christ, not for anything else, not for anything else. I love the chiefs, but I... I don't love them as much as I love Christ, you know? And so we just need to get back to the basics on this. And so we, we got we to gotta understand that we're influencing people. Um, let me really quick, I'll give you a couple of illustrations about this. So uh, I, we've been talking about the advancement of technology. And when this Walkman came out, this was like a, a, a breakthrough in technology. All of these are, I mean, just an advance to, to where we are today where the, the internet and everything is so crazy. But what they did is, this goes all the way back to the 1980s, like the Billy Graham Association and, uh, and other evangelists like Ravi Zacharias and, and the Navigators and others. What they did is they started leveraging their technology. They were going, oh man, we got this Walkman. How can we use this to further the gospel? And so what they started doing is they were taking... Um, they, they were taking sermons from like Charles Stanley and from other pastors in the country. They were taking salvation messages and, and putting it on a cassette tape and they would ship these to missionaries and having them give them out in like villages and tribes that have never heard the gospel before. And then, and then when the CD came out, they did the same thing with these. And one of the greatest things that happened was when they invented the MP3 player, one of the first things that they did was th those same organizations, they downloaded the Bible, the whole Bible in languages that had never been done before, and they put it on an MP3 player, this little device, and they sent headphones, and they would send it to missionaries, and they would take it into these villages, and people would hear the gospel in their language for the first time in their life, and it changed their life. And there's been, there's been revivals happening all around the world. Why? Because they, they leverage the technology that they have. Now, technology's, you know, neutral, right? It can be used for good. The internet's neutral. It can be used for great great things. It can be used for like, you know, we can share the gospel with it and there's pornography on it. So it's just up to you how you want to utilize that. I was um, doing some research a few years, a couple years ago and I was about the photograph, like when the camera was invented. I mean, the photograph's been around for a while, but when the camera was invented, it said, I read this article where it said something like it only took 10 years for the first pornographic uh, image like somebody posed did a nude selfie and like that didn't take long you know what I mean like it doesn't take long for people to pervert technology that's out there people are, there, there's evil influences that's always going to be trying to do that we need to be the counter the Christians need to be standing up against that and going you know what the internet's awesome let's let's brainstorm let's figure out how we can use that to advance the kingdom and see more people go to heaven than go to hell okay so we've got to be invo involved in that uh, number, number five, just write this down. We need to be adaptable and winsome. So when I'm talking about sharing your faith, look, you don't want to be the person that just po pokes people in the eye. You want to be, you know what the word winsome is? I love that word. When, go to the next slide. Here's a definition. It means to be attractive or appealing in appearance or character. So when you're winsome in terms of evangelism, you're, you're a person who's attractive. People are going, man, there's something different about you. I like that. I like that. You don't want to be the person that just gets on Facebook and says, I stand for, I'm pro-life, and if you're, you know, pro-choice, you're a baby killer and all that stuff. You, you're going you're gonna to repel people by doing stuff like that. You're just poking people in the eye. There's a way to be attractional when we talk about this. Now, and the good way to look at it, look at it, win some. That's our goal. We want to be winsome, so we want to win some people. That's what the ultimate objective, and let me just show you this. Two, two passages, and I'm almost done. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 19. This is the Apostle Paul. Here's what he says. He goes, even though I am a free man with no master, uh, I have become a slave to all people. Why? 
to, to bring many to Christ. He goes, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the, under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I can bring, uh, bring to Christ those who are under the law. When, when I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so it can bring them to Christ. He goes, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Now, verse 22, when I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. For, those, uh, for, for I want to bring uh, the weak to Christ. He goes, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. That, that's the objective. He goes, he goes, when I'm with this group, I, I kind of act like this group. You know, the old thing, when you're with the Romans, you know, uh, you, the, you know when in Rome, be like the Romans, that, that thing. Now, you got to be careful because you don't want to be so adaptable to our culture that you fit right in and there's nothing distinguishable about you. We want to be, be noticeably different that we're Christians. Now, the, here's the last thing. I want to give you this, and then we're, we're going to wrap this up. Number, number six is that we need to have a burden. And honestly, this is what I think is missing from the majority of the Christians that I see is that, that, that we don't have a burden for the lost. Because if you had a burden for lost people, you would open your mouth and you would speak. You would invite people to church. You would be involved in evangelism. Because here's what, uh, just really quick, I want everyone to look up here. I, I don't care if you're taking notes or, or what, but listen to me. Th- I believe this with all my heart, you, and you can disagree with me, but I, I believe the Bible this book doesn't change. And when I read the Bible, I read what, what Jesus taught was that when people die, okay, everyone in this room is going to live, you're living, and every one of us are going to die, and you're going to live, you, your soul will live, live on for eternity. You will never have an end to your life, ever. And you will go to heaven, or you will go to hell. There's no after place. There, like, there's, um, I was listening to the radio the other day on Caleb, and they were talking about this great thing, and I'm thinking about doing a sermon series on it, but it's this concept of, hey, why don't we bring flowers to people while they can still smell them? You, you ever thought about that? Like, what, like why, why is it that we wait till someone's in a casket at their funeral and we utilize them and say, oh, this person was great? Well, why didn't you tell them to begin with? Why didn't you tell them while they were still breathing? Bring them flowers while they can still smell them. I love that concept. But what I thought about was like, why do we wait till a person's dead and then they're casted to go, man, I should have invited them to church. I should have shared the gospel. Because you know why? You, you know why? That, it's too late for them. Okay. The person in their casket, it's too late. They don't go to purgatory. There's no afterlife place that they go and hope that God's going to change his mind. No, you have a chance. You live and you die, and it's over. Time's up. The clock stops. No more second chances. And based on what you did with Christ, you go to heaven if you're a Christian, and you go to hell if, you're, if you reject Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. And I don't know why pastors are afraid to get up and talk about this. I don't know why it makes you uncomfortable to hear it. Because... I, I don't like to think about hell. I don't like to think about people that I love really dearly have rejected Christ. And when they die, if they don't accept Christ, they're going to go to hell for all of eternity. Not just a thousand years, but all of eternity. So we're not just up here playing games. We're talking about heaven and hell for all of eternity. That's why when you read about Jesus, Jesus didn't mince words. He talked about hell a lot. You know what he said about it? He goes, it lasts forever. And he goes, there's fire and there's, there's suffering, and he goes, there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the people want to get out of there, but they're never getting out of there. Now, I know you didn't come here today to hear this kind of message, but you need to hear that. It's why you need to have a burden for somebody that needs to get saved. Somebody in your sphere of influence is counting on you to share the gospel with them. And so that's why you clean your life up. That's why you should repent of your sins and just live for God and let the chips fall where they may. And when people ask you, but hey, how come you don't do what I do? It's because I'm trying to follow Jesus, and it's an awesome life. You're flapping your butterfly wings, and you're going, this is awesome. I don't want to go back and hang out with caterpillars. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? I've got the life. So here's what he says. With everything I just said, think about this right here. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul was so burdened for, his, for the Jewish people that, that he said this. He goes, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience uh, and the Holy Spirit confirms it. He goes, verse two, he goes, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people. 
He says, my Jewish brothers and sisters, he goes, he goes, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. You know what he's saying? I would be willing to go to hell for all of eternity for my Jewish brothers and sisters. He, he had that type of burden that he wanted them to get saved so bad that he was like, I would go to hell. Have you ever thought about that before? I've, I've thought about that. And I don't, I'm being honest with you, I don't know what I would do. That based on everything I know about hell, that it lasts forever. It's, it's for all of eternity, and it's suffering, and it's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I think, would, would, I, would I give up my salvation and go there for somebody on planet Earth? And I love my kids and my wife, and I love, I love people dearly. That's a hard thing to ask. That's a hard thing to think about. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, you don't get that option. Like, you can't make that choice for another person. They have to make that. All you can do is try and be winsome and try and influence them in a positive way to accept Christ, right? But this is heavy stuff. When, when Paul says, I'd be willing to go to hell forever because I care that much about it, that's a burden. Like, I don't really have, but I want it. You know what I'm saying? That's a burden. That's caring about people like, like I've never even thought of before. It's crazy. So um, let's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up in just a second. Um, so we, we just need to, we, we need to be about this. I want to give you homework. I want you to think about this this week and go, uh, I want you to, you, if you're taking notes, just write this down. Your homework is, I want you to go share your story with somebody this week that doesn't know Christ. Share, just share your story. You, you say, well, what's my testimony? Remember, your testimony is what God has done in your life. Has God done anything good in your life? Just share that with somebody. With, with anybody, just say, let me tell you what God's done in my life. Uh, here's another thing you write if you're taking notes. Uh, learn the Romans road. Because some of you guys are like, I don't know any of the Bible. I don't have it memorized. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. I, I don't remember if I talked about this in this sermon or the, the 9 o'clock service. But the whole idea of a witness, did I talk about that in here? You know, to witness, I talked about this with the men a couple weeks ago. So I was listening to the radio, and I heard this little, this little concept. And they said, God expects us to be a witness to the world. And you say, that, what, what is that? Where does that come from? Well, that's a legal term. So if you've ever been called as a witness in a uh, criminal case, like, like you witnessed a m- murder or a car accident or just anything, what do they do? They call you on the stand. They put you on the stand. You have to put your hand on a Bible, and you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so hope you got right, that thing. And you get up there, and what do they say? They, they don't go, we need you to know all the facts of the case. No, you don't know all the facts of the case. You don't know all the laws. What do you know? You're an expert in what you're about to testify about. You testify about, they say, tell us about what you've seen and what you've heard. That's what a witness does. A witness tells people what they've seen and what they've heard. You don't have to know all the other stuff. You just have to know what you saw and what you've heard, what you've experienced about Christ. That's what being a witness is all about. And every person in this room can do that. You can be a witness for Christ this week. So one of the ways you do that is learn the Romans road. If you're talking to somebody and they say, yeah, you know what? I want to get saved. Well, what do you do then? You you should know the Romans road. The Romans road, if you're taking notes, it's Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then you need to know Romans 5.8. There's just four of them. There's four verses. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? And you talk to them about that. Hey, even though you're a sinner, God loves you. And then Romans 10.13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just four easy verses. Everyone in here can do that. If you know your address, you can know these four verses, and everyone should learn them, okay? And then in a few weeks, we're going to have a friend day here, and that's your opportunity to invite someone that doesn't go to church to, to our friend day. Just say, would you, we're going to have cards. Just say, would you, would, would you just take this card? Would you show up at church this Sunday and be my guest? You would be blown away at how many people will actually take you up on that offer. So just what do you got to lose? Invite them. So there's, there's people here. I'll just show you how this happens. Uh, Jen, I told you about Jenny. J- Jenny's here because of Hillary, okay? And she's here now because of God. But, but Jenny showed up back on our uh, Christmas Eve service. But, but that wasn't her first experience with Grace Church. She had been wa- she's been dear friends with Hillary for years, right? 
And, but she's been, she had been lurking in the shadows just watching Hillary. Like she had been struggling with an, a meth addiction for a while. And even before that, just struggling with life. But she wasn't ready. But, but she was just standing over to the side watching Hillary go to church and watching Hillary change her life for the better. And, and when she was ready, she was like, if I'm going to reach out to someone to help me with my life, it's going to be Hillary, right? That, that's what I'm talking about. God wants to do that with you, with somebody else. So that's why you need to leverage your social media accounts and, and whatever you're doing on Facebook. Use it for positive because you want people to reach out to you when they're ready to take that step, okay? And there's other people in our church that they're here because someone else was just really faithful in our church for a lot of years, and they, they're just attractional, and they just bring people to Christ. God wants to do that with you too, okay? So let's, let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. I know this has been, this has been long. I've probably talked way more than I, I intended to. But I just, guys, in my life, this is what fires me up more than anything else. And this is where the church is deficient across the board. We are not doing our jobs. We are not seeing people saved like they need to be. The, the church as a whole is not proclaiming the gospel. Everything I just told you, as uncomfortable as it was even for me to tell you about hell, churches aren't doing that anymore. And if it's real, if hell is real, why shouldn't I tell you that? Don't you deserve to know what's at stake? Yes, you do. Doesn't your friend, doesn't your next door neighbor and your coworker deserve to have a chance to accept Christ? They might say no, or they might, you might just be planting seeds. I found that to be true a lot. I, I invite someone to church. Oh, yeah, someday I'll go. And, and that someday may, you know, may never happen, or it might when they're ready. Let's leave that up to God. You do your part. Let God do his part. But let's do our part. Let's be active. Let's be intentional about shining the light of Christ in our community so that people will come to Christ. Last thing I want to say with your heads bowed and eyes closed is uh, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I mean, maybe something I said just triggered that and you're just thinking, man, I don't know. I, maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I'm not saved. Listen, right where you're at, right where you're sitting, you can accept Christ into your life. I did it by just praying a prayer 23 years ago. You can do it also by praying a prayer. And I want to give you an example of a prayer, prayer to pray. You can pray something like this right where you're sitting. Pray, just repeat this with me silently. Just say, dear God. Just say, God, right, right here. I, just say, God, I'm serious in this moment. And I, right now, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want you to be my Savior, God. And just tell him, say, I will follow you all the days of my life. I won't turn back when things get hard, but this is the day that I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.